everything looks good. I'm going to start. Say when. You're good. Are we good? We live? You are live. Yay, Matt McGlynn. We're back. How are you, my friend? <laughs> I'm well. Thank you, Warren. I've got my usual prop. I just realized what I do. I think it's an emotional thing. I just have a guitar in my hand so I can, in the background, you'll hear me go. <laughs> <laughs> there is, first of all, welcome. Secondly, there is an amazing cheat sheet around here, which I was looking at early this morning, which is amazing. I don't know. It's probably underneath the video. Is that correct, gentlemen? I'm getting a... Uh... Anyway, it'll be down there. There'll be a, a, a cheat sheet down there. I highly recommend that you click on it, and Matt's going to talk us through it. So uh, right what, what gave you the idea of it? Was it just hundreds of thousands of questions that you thought you could answer quite easily? Um yeah yes and no uh so first of all thank you for having me back i know i've been here a couple of times thank you and um uh yeah my marketing guy uh put me up to giving a presentation at a, a thing called the parsons audio expo last fall and i thought well what am i going to talk about well, clearly microphones <laughs> um, but what you know what what could i give to people that they could take home and actually do something with and for your audience i'm hoping that this is really uh helpful when I've come here in the past, you know, we've talked about stuff and told stories and talked about microphones. And a lot of people want to know, what do you think about this microphone? And what do you think about that microphone? And I'm happy to answer those kinds of questions. And we may get to that at the end. But, you know, what that guy wants to know about this specific microphone doesn't help the other thousand people who might watch this and who don't care about that microphone. But what I could do instead with this time that I think would be more valuable to everybody would be to give people a sort of framework for how to think about microphones and more specifically how to buy them. Because, let's face it, everybody here wants another one, right? I mean, no one's probably satisfied with what they've got. And absent some kind of uh, method for selecting something, like the next one that you need, uh, what are you going to go by? A magazine ad? A testimonial from someone you respect? I mean, these are, ne are not necessarily bad ways to go, but maybe there's a better way that ensures that you get something that fills that gap in your collection. And maybe you didn't even realize you had a gap. And I get that sort of head smack that zen forehead slap a lot from people who say oh my god i didn't realize that there was a microphone that sounded like this and now i'm going to use it on everything you know so uh yep. anyway that's that's what i'd love to do with this that's the, that's the intent of this wonderful i, lo I love you just touching the uh, use on everything because uh with the last video I did with the Delphos, I, we just moved it around. I, I know you had said that uh, Glenn loved it on guitars, so obviously we put it on electric guitar for the rhythm and the lead. But we used it as a mono mic on the drum kit, which I thought performed really, really well. Um, a vocal mic. Again, I didn't use the pop screen, which uh, lots of people pointed out. But I, I, I kind of feel like the pop screen, I know it's going to get rid of some of the low end on the pops and the P's and all this stuff. But... I can remove that afterwards. I just want the mic to sound like the way it might sound. I actually really liked it on the mono piano and acoustic guitar. Cool. I, I, yeah. it's, it might be out my AEA uh, ribbon on, a, on the uh, piano every now and then for a complete. So, But overall, the drum mix was probably the most impressive, I thought. Just like the fact that it was picking up the low end of the kick and the snap of the snare, um, you know, with just one mic pulled back like six feet is pretty awesome. And I'm a yeah. crappy drummer, a really bad drummer. So, <laughs> so if a mic is flattering me, then it's a good thing. Yeah, well, you're a better drummer than you give yourself credit for. In fact, I was quite impressed with the way that you handle all, all those instruments. So kudos to you for that. And thank well, you thank for the video. You. That's awesome. Um, you know, miking a drum kit, as, as a drummer, putting one mic on a drum kit for me is like sticking a fork in my eye. I mean, I would never do that. <laughs> it just bothers me to no end when I was up and coming and I was so frustrated because you couldn't buy an interface that had as many inputs as I needed for my drum kit. And I don't even play like the giant Terry Bozio kind of kit. It's, hey. you know, a, a fairly modest uh, five piece. Um, nice. But still, you need 13 channels. I'm sorry, you just do. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, mono mic on drums, that's a tough thing. But, uh, yeah, it sounded good. And it's, but that's placement too, right? I mean, as you know, that's putting the mic in the right place is 80% of that battle. I think so. And I think, to be honest, it's, uh, and this is a good thing for the, all the home recorders, so which I'm sure there's thousands that are going to watch this. Um, I actually think mono drum miking is easier in a home environment than in a big studio. I know that sounds silly, but when I've got my drum room is about the size of a bedroom and it's pretty dead and room mics are kind of useless. So as long as you play evenly-ish, 
a mono room mic in there sounds better than it would in a big open splashy drum room where the cymbals are going crazy and it's super bright so um you know i think you sort of sometimes the um limitations are an advantage in those kind of situations absolutely yeah i mean so, who, who hasn't said that having unlimited tracks is a bad thing <laughs> yeah exactly yes exactly and um you know, again, I, 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 I really was impressed with the mic overall and everything. I think it's tamed top end is probably why it works so well with drums. Um, you know, because the biggest thing, as a, as you know, as a, from my perspective, anyway, at least as a producer, engineer, mixer guy, is when I'm dealing with uh, drummers that maybe haven't been recorded quite so much, um, they overplay their cymbals and downplay their kick and snare. Um and having a mic that has a nice, controlled, smooth top end is a blessing for mono drums, or anything on drums, quite frankly, because it's not exaggerating that harshness in the right. high end. Right. Yeah, especially uh, if you have inexpensive cymbals, which you don't, but uh, some of those cheaper cymbals sound worse, so taming them is even right. better. Yeah, and there's even some expensive cymbals which the sizzle is out of control. I've always been a just as a drum set thing for a second, because you're a drummer, I've always been split between Peisty and Zildjian's. Those have always been my two favorites for different things. Zildjian's, I love the thickness and the warmth. But Peisty, I also love the fact that they actually sound like a finished, mixed cymbal the moment you play them, because they take away some of that low mid that you always pull out. Yeah. I don't know. As a, just a quick sideline, I know we're talking mics, but because you are a drummer and you also understand mics and recording, what do you use? Um, I've always been a Zildjian guy, and I some of some of them uh, now are uh, Sabian as well, which is kind of like, kind of like also Zildjian. I'm not an expert on the history, but there's a family relationship there. Brothers. Um, so uh, yeah, so uh, that's my thing. And I was never okay. a Peisty guy, but I will say this: there was a, a video I just saw. I think it's a new video, and I think the guy's name, his last name is Priester, and he's got the giant drum kit, you know, hundred piece. Yep. Achilles, Aquilus, I don't know how to say his first name, but he was doing a cymbal demo for Color Sound Cymbals from Peisty. And I have to say the articulation on the cymbals was amazing because he was actually doing fills that went from snare to ride. And, you know, the snare is a big, loud, very yep. full sounding instrument. And the ride was right there with it, which is amazing because right. it's not it doesn't have, you know, that big resonant shell and all this. So, yeah, I was I was pretty impressed. Well, my just to, and sorry to top it off because I know we, we were here to microphones, but I, I love picking your brains, drummer. Um, just so you know, my standard cymbal set, and I have a lot of different cymbals. And when different drummers come in, they swap it out. Matt Starr, Brad Wilk, or whatever, they'll come in and they'll swap out the cymbals for what they want. It's usually ninety percent Zildjian, but the ride is always the Peisty because it's such a synonymous John Bonham ride that Peisty ah. 2002, yeah. and it does immediately sound EQ'd. So it's funny you should pick up on the ride symbol. I, I do think that it's hard push because our ears hear that Bonham ride when he's playing under the solo. Yeah, and I think we just love that. It's a little bit like why we always, if, if there's a snare that you love, it's 50-50, it's probably a superphonic or maybe <laughs> a Black Beauty. Everybody goes, oh, I love your snare sound. What is it? And you go, oh, it's a Ludwig Superphonic. It's just, we grew up listening to the sound of that snare. So that's what we associate with a great snare sound. Right. Anyway, enough of me waffling on. I'm famous for it. Uh, just let you take the floor and let's do this uh, presentation. I'm very excited. Right on. Okay. So, so I'm going to uh, go through this. This is, a, so by way of introduction, this is a, uh, this is an excerpt from a longer presentation. Uh, it's nominally called how to build a mic locker. Um, and it ends with the sort of, uh, not a shopping guide, but a way that you can create your own shopping guide to fill those gaps in your mic locker. So that's what we're driving towards. And, uh, the thesis is basically that the way a microphone is built determines how it sounds. And because you can't know in a vacuum what any microphone sounds like, but you can understand how it was made and specifically what components are in it that determine what it sounds like. You can know that in advance and that helps you narrow your field of choices. So that's kind of where we're going with this. I'll do a screen share. Um, oh, what I was going to say is um, there is a, uh, an opportunity for those of you who are recording students in a recording school or, or in a recording program uh, to have me come out and give this, uh, the full version of this live to your class. Uh, if you're interested in that, let me know. We can probably make that happen. 
Right. Um, without further ado, let me do the screen share. And uh, we haven't done a screen share like this before, so I don't know how well this is going to go. Um, we live and we learn, as my dad would say. Yes, we do. So, yeah, it's going to be not in presentation mode because then, actually, you know what? Let me try that first. No, I can't. Sorry. Technical difficulties. We're going to do it this way, and it's going to be okay. So, can you guys see the title screen there? I can. Uh, Eric's not watching at the moment, but uh, it looks like it's coming through okay. Okay. So, uh, this is what we're trying to get to. Everybody has a collection of microphones, and they all look different, and that's totally awesome. Uh, this is one guy's collection. And, uh, but everyone's is different and no matter what microphones everybody has, everyone has the same question about their collection, which is what do I buy to fill that gap? And that's what we'd like to get to. Let's pretend you had $10,000 to spend on microphones. Uh, I would suggest that this particular way to spend $10,000 worth of microphones is terrible. <laughs> and it's not because that's a bad mic, not at all, but it's because if those are the, if that's the only microphone you have, um, then you're in for some rough sessions. Because what do you do if you put this microphone up and uh, on a singer, a female singer, say, and she sounds really sibilant and thin uh, and, uh, and, and bad through this microphone? You're going to take it down and put up another of the same thing? No, because you get the exact same result. So what are we getting at? What we need in our microphone collections is diversity. We need a bunch of microphones that sound different. This is, in fact, why there's three or 4,000 microphones on the market. They don't all sound the same, and they shouldn't all sound the same, and you should be buying the ones that sound a little bit different from what you already have. So, is the, are the slides still working? People can still see? I can. I'm, I'm still seeing. Yeah, I'm, I'm watching the uh, YouTube link here, and I see. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay. Right on. So, uh, the reality is there's an entire universe of sounds everybody wants to record, Hey, there's, there's drums, there's vocals, there's bass, there's guitar, uh, and a million other things. Um, but even within a single one of those, like the simplest thing, the human voice, there's nothing simple about that at all, right? There's people with high voices, low voices, growls. Uh, there's different kinds of vocal presentation, right? There's kind of metal vocals, there's opera, everything in between. So there's this entire universe of sounds that you'd like to record. And any microphone that you pick up, I don't care how good or bad it is, it's incapable of recording every sound well, okay? So the, the green circle on this graph uh, is a representation of the subset of the universe of sounds that you might like to record that this microphone is good for. For some microphones, it's a really big green circle, and for some, it's a tiny little dot because it's really good at only one thing, all right? Uh, but the point is that we want, if we want to record this entire sort of universe of sounds, we need a bunch of microphones to, to overlap and fill up that big gray circle. And so in contrast to the, the slide I showed a second ago with three of the same microphone, here's a way to spend half as much money on a really diverse set of microphones. Now, this is not a shopping list. These are microphones that I like and that I would know what to do with, and your list would be different. But just to throw some ideas out there where a smaller budget gets you a more competent mic locker, all right? Let's say you had to record drums. Well, we've got some ElectroVoice ND468s in the left there. They're fantastic on, on uh, snare and toms. Uh, you need to put a mic on kick? Well, there's an SM7. Works wonders on kick. Uh, you need overheads and rooms? Well, you've got four choices there. Uh, let's say you want to record vocals. SM7. That could be great. The Vinjet, maybe, for certain kinds of vocals. Uh, the Roswell Mini K47, that's one of my microphones. On some vocals, it's amazing. Um, the... Uh, but lots of choices. Guitar cab, again, you know, almost pick any microphone there. Some of these are used. Um, some of these are DIY. Um, most of these are inexpensive. But the point is, if you buy intelligently, you can pick, uh, you can put together a mic locker that can cover a ton of bases, a ton of sources without spending a fortune. So uh, we need to build diversity into our microphone collections in order to get to this goal of uh, sonic diversity. And what I would propose to everyone is that the way to do that is to buy microphones of different types. So pictured here are representations of the three most common types of microphones. From left to right, ribbon, moving coil dynamic, and condenser. Uh, the ribbon on the left is an old RCA uh, 10001, uh, uh, the SM57 in the middle, of course, and then a U87. Um, but 
these microphones all work differently and therefore they sound different. Uh, how do they work differently? Um, on the left is a ribbon transducer. It's a thin piece of foil suspended between magnets. Uh, in the middle is a typical moving coil dynamic cartridge as found in an SM57, for example. On the right is a large diaphragm condenser capsule. We'll get into some of these in more detail in a minute, but the point is they all look very different. They all work very differently, and therefore they're going to sound different. Uh, we'll spend the bulk of this talk talking about uh, condenser microphones uh, in the interest of time. Uh, here's a picture of the four main styles of large diaphragm condenser capsule that you're going to see. Um, studio engineers like large diaphragm condensers on a lot of sources, and you can use them on almost anything. Um, so this type of microphone is the one that's likely to be overrepresented in your collection. So we'll spend the bulk of our time talking about this, this type. And we'll get into more detail about what these are, but you can see at a glance they look different, and that's worth noting for right now. Uh, we'll also talk about the different circuit types in just a little bit of detail, because there are things you can look at and notice that will affect how the microphone sounds. And again, what we're trying to get to is, what can we know in advance of buying a microphone about how it's going to sound? And if we look at some, if we call out a couple of components like the capsule and the kind of circuit that it is, that it has, that will influence uh, our opinion of what this is likely to sound like. Um, then I'm going to uh, make a mention of my old website recording hacks because when we're talking about the guts of a microphone, what's in it that affects how it sounds, this is a great source to go to to find out. Uh, so here's a screenshot of a particular microphone profile page from the mic database that goes into kind of an obscene amount of detail about a specific microphone. Um, they're not all this detailed, but most of them will give you uh, the highlights of the topology, meaning what kind of capsules in it, what kind of circuits in it. You can see on this Bach 507 page, it shows a photo of the capsule. Uh, on this next page, there's uh, this is the AT5040 from Audio-Technica, again shows the capsule. Why? Because in a condenser microphone, the capsule significantly determines what that microphone is going to sound like. And so that's why we talk about those kinds of characteristics in the, um, in the mic database. Okay. So we'll breeze through how uh, moving coil dynamics and ribbon mics work, and then we'll spend a little bit more time on, uh, on condensers. Uh, moving coil dynamic has a thin diaphragm attached to a voice coil, uh, which and then the sound waves hit the diaphragm, it moves that voice coil, and, and stuck up inside the voice coil is a magnet. And the movement of a coil of wire over a magnet induces current onto the coil, which comes out as voltage. That's, you know, in 10 words or less, that's how a dynamic mic works. But what we're interested in is how those physical characteristics affect the sound of the microphone. Uh, because that moving assembly has relatively high mass and it doesn't move very far, Dynamics tend to be able to accommodate high SPLs like snares and kick drums and brass without distorting. But a side effect of that is they tend to capture limited high frequency detail. Okay, if you've, everyone's put a 57 on a guitar cab, um, swap that out for a, di or for, a, for a large diaphragm condenser, you'll hear an amazing difference in the amount of detail that's captured. Why? Because moving coil dynamics tends not to capture that kind of detail. Okay, so... Sonic characteristics are determined by the structure of the microphone. Let's look briefly at a ribbon microphone. Uh, this is the transducer in a ribbon mic. Uh, it's a corrugated piece of very thin metal, usually aluminum, but not always, suspended in a, in a field between two magnets. As sound pressure hits the front or back of that ribbon, it moves back and forth, and that causes, in a nutshell, it causes voltage to come out the bottom. Um, what's interesting about that is the sonic results. Okay, one really interesting thing is that these tend to have a figure eight polar pattern. Why is that? Because if you're, jump back to the ribbon, if you're speaking at this ribbon from the side, then your voice, the pressure of your voice, the sound waves of your voice are hitting the front and back of that ribbon from both sides simultaneously. Equal opposing forces cancel out, the ribbon doesn't move. That's why you have a null in the figure eight pattern of a ribbon mic. There are other sonic characteristics. Um, for example, they have, they tend to have low output and therefore need significant, uh, clean gain in order to get a usable signal level, unless it's an active ribbon, which is to say, unless it has a built-in gain stage. 
Okay, so again, sonic uh, characteristics result from the construction of the microphone. Now let's get into condenser mics. Uh, so this is a picture of a large diaphragm condenser with some of the terminology that describes the parts of it. And then on the right, there's a, a cutaway view. Um, now, a condenser microphone capsule is basically a capacitor. What is a capacitor? It's two metal plates separated by a gap. Um, in the case of a condenser capsule, the front plate, the metal plate, is actually a very, very thin piece of plastic or mylar. It's also called the diaphragm. And in its native state, it isn't metal at all, but metal is painted onto it, usually gold, because gold doesn't corrode. So the front plate of this capacitor is a flexible plate. It's thin mylar, really thin, like on the order of microns, metallized with gold or aluminum or some kind of alloy. And what's magic about this is that when you speak at it or play a sound source at it, um, that front plate or that diaphragm vibrates, and the vibration changes the spacing between it and the back plate, which is the, the rear metal plate. And as that gap changes, uh, the capacitance changes. And what this means, though, is if you pump a voltage into it, and then that gap changes, the voltage coming out of this capacitor changes. As, so you're getting an AC audio signal out of this as a result of sound waves hitting that front diaphragm. Now, um, a, a speaker is kind of the same thing in reverse. In a speaker, you're putting voltage in, and then there's some kind of, essentially, a diaphragm moving, and it's creating sound waves coming out. So these, these are both transducers meaning they convert energy of one form into energy of another form, voltage into uh, acoustic energy or vice versa. But you can imagine just as with, uh, as speaker construction differs, right? If you change uh, the kind of material used for the cone or the size of that voice coil or, um, right, I'm not a speaker guy, but there's a lot of physical characteristics of a speaker, how it's mounted, uh, the box into which it's mounted, is it ported, is it not? All of those dramatically change the sound of the speaker. Well, the same thing is true of a microphone capsule. If you build it differently, th the audio that it transduces will be captured differently. Okay? Uh, briefly talking about how the rest of the condenser mic works, um, we didn't have a slide like this for ribbons and dynamics because they don't tend to have circuits. They tend to just have a transducer coupled to your XLR jack. Um, or maybe with a transformer in between, maybe not. In a condenser mic, you need to have some circuitry to do impedance conversion. And for our purposes, it's a black box. It doesn't matter what that is so much at this stage. Um, but there's this thing in the middle that that requires voltage and powers your capsule and does impedance conversion. And again, we come to the sonic results of all of this, okay? Uh, the way the thing is built determines how it sounds. In the case of a condenser, it means... Uh, that because it's this sort of delicate electronic circuitry, it can overload if you pump it with super high volume input. Um, now, in practical question, are we, uh, Eric? You still seeing the video? Yeah, it's still streaming. All right. Yeah, we're going to get to questions. We'll have time for questions at the end. So I'm kind of blazing through this, but uh, jot your questions down. And Warren will be able to see them, and maybe I will too. Yeah, what I'm doing. Questions. Hey guys, I'm glad you're saying that. Just guys, if it, it, I'm, I hope it doesn't look like I'm disinterested. I'm reading your questions and making notes. <laughs> That's why I keep looking down because I started to respond to you by typing on my laptop, and Matt D was like, "Dude, I can hear you going," <laughs> while Matt McGlynn was talking. So I'm not disinterested. I'm looking at your comments as they come by. <laughs> Cool. And please, everybody, like and share. It's how YouTube tells the world that we're here. So please like and share. Anyway, sorry, Matt. I have a ton of questions for you as well, but I don't want to interrupt you. So please right take on. the stage. Um, okay. So uh, sonic characteristics of the condenser mic resulting from how it's built. Um, so the diaphragm is very, very low mass. It vibrates very easily it, with even the hint of a whisper of a sound. And so as a result, condensers tend to capture extended frequency response with a good amount of detail. They tend to have a high output, which means you don't necessarily need a pristine preamp signal path, um, but they can overload because they have these delicate electronics. Uh, now, they can be padded internally if you wanted to make a kick drum condenser mic. That can happen, um, but that's the designer's decision. And the, the fact is that in a general sense, condenser microphones are more sensitive to dynamics than other types. So what we've said repeatedly is that the design of the mic determines the sound of the mic. Why do we care about this? 
because this completely feeds our need to fill that gap in our mic lockers. Okay. If we, if our task is to buy a mic that sounds different from the one that, from the ones that we already own, then a shortcut way to get there, meaning short of auditioning a ton of choices would be to narrow that field by finding one that was designed and made differently. And we're going to give you the tools to do that. Here's what you don't want to do. Uh, this is a, a, this is a representation of someone who came to me and said, uh, here's what I own. What should I buy next? And I said, you know, you, you could buy pretty much anything that isn't one of those and you'd be in really good shape. He didn't know this, uh, but all five of those microphones have the exact same circuit. And uh, the two tall ones have the exact same capsule and the other three have the exact same capsule. Okay. So there's two capsules and, and one circuit represented here. It doesn't mean they all sound identical, but kind of, sort of, they all sound pretty much the same. There's not, say, let me say that a, a more accurate way. Uh, there's not a ton of sonic variation here. Whereas if you would stick a dynamic or a ribbon or a condenser that had a different kind of capsule in it, or a condenser that had a tube circuit or a transformer circuit in it. Those are ways that would inject a lot more sonic variety into this particular collection. So how do we get to there? How do we get to the point where we know what we should be buying? And again, all of you listening have a different collection of microphones. Uh, so your gaps are all different. Uh, but this is, this is how we get to the place where you say, okay, here's where the gap in my collection is. Um, in a condenser mic, the capsule significantly determines what the microphone sounds like. Most microphone circuits are linear with respect to frequency. Uh, the U47 circuit, for example, was linear out to like 40K. All right. Um, now, circuits do have some sonic impact, and we'll get to that in a minute. But in a condenser mic, the best way to understand what it's likely to sound like is to look at what kind of capsule is in it, because each of these different capsule types has a characteristic sound and doesn't mean they all sound exactly the same, meaning if you take the CK12 from AKG and all the people who make CK12 sorts of copies or clones or tribute capsules, it doesn't mean they all sound identical. No, of course not, but they share sonic characteristics, okay? And all of those are going to be, are going to be pretty different from all of the K47 style capsules in the world. And all of those are going to be pretty different from all the K67s, right? So there's kind of neighborhoods of sound here. And if you want something that sounds like a K47 capsule, you have to buy a K47 capsule mic. That's the only way to do it. The CK12 is never going to sound like a K47, all right? The K67 is never going to sound like a K47. You just can't get there. You can do EQ and post, maybe, but still, it's not the same thing. So why I show these to you now is because you can see them. You can see the differences. So even if you can't, uh, you don't have the mic in your hand to listen to, you can find out what kind of capsules in it or if you can see a photo of the guts of the mic, you can get to this point where you say, okay, I understand what sonic neighborhood that one's in, and I've already got three of those, so that mic's probably not on my short list. So let's just call out some of these obvious visual differences. So if you come across a, a photograph of something, you'll, you'll know what it is. The one on the left is a, a capsule invented by AKG. This pictured one isn't actually AKG's capsule, because um, I didn't have a good picture of that, but it's, it's a pretty good copy of one. Um, the most obvious visual characteristic is that it has no screw in the center of the diaphragm. Okay. That's what we call edge terminated. That metalized diaphragm area extends all the way to the clamping ring. That's the thing with the screws in it. And there's no screw in the middle of it. Um, also a more subtle thing is that it has two back plates and we'll, we'll point that out more in a second here, but you can see that, that, that black wire coming down, it comes down and it splits into two and there's two screws, one into each back plate half. Um, the next one is the K47, a very famous capsule, uh, notable for its single back plate. That's the piece of brass that forms the bulk of the capsule. Um, and then it does have the screw in the center. Uh, and then the next one is the K67, two back plates. You can see the groove that separates the two back plates in half. And it does have the screw in the center. And the last one is the uh, M7, invented by Neumann, today made by Gefell, Microtech Gefell, and also made by a couple of other companies, Tiersch in Germany, uh, it's not a microphone company, but he makes that capsule. And then uh, Chuck Dickinson at Cathedral Pipes makes a version of the M7 in his Cathedral Pipes guitars. Um, so the, the most common that you're going to see in the world today or in the wild would be the two in the middle, uh, the K47 and the K67. The K67 and, and copies of it, are th those are the most common capsules in the entire world. Why? Because 
that's the one all the Chinese factories copied uh, when they started making microphones for the consumer market in the 80s or 90s or whatever it was. That's the capsule they copied because it's easier to make than the K47 or the CK12 or the M7. So it's the easiest to make of all of them. Uh, and so it's the most commonly made one today. Um, now, if you're looking at the face of the capsule, it can be hard to tell apart the K67 and the K47. They both have that center termination screw. They both have a clamping ring around the outside. The way to tell them apart is the drilling pattern. Uh, that's the pattern of holes drilled into the back plate. So the bottom two pictures are what gets you to understand the differences. On the K47, the holes are drilled in a concentric ring, rather a series of concentric rings. In the K67, it's more of a grid, kind of a square grid array. You can kind of see it in the photo there. And so the, the lines of, row, of uh, drill holes form um, tangents to the curve of the capsule, okay, as opposed to forming a concentric ring. Um, so that's kind of a spotter's guide. With these couple of characteristics, you know, is there or is there not a screw in the center? What does that drilling pattern look like? Uh, is the clamping ring missing on the M7? Those couple of questions will let you identify which of these four capsules you're looking at. Um, another way uh, to find, well, we'll get to that in a second. So why do we care about these four capsule types? Like, well, like I said, um, these capsules all have a distinctive sound. And this, this is kind of one of the money pages of this presentation. And, and this is in the handout or the, the download that you can find in the link below the, the video. The cheat sheet. The cheat sheet. Please, yeah. If you download the cheat sheet, you're going to get this information here with the capsules. So this was a fun thing. What I did was I took a microphone that had a very linear, very transparent circuit in it. And I put one of each capsule into it. And then I did a swept sine wave test. Uh, so the only thing that varied from test to test was the capsule itself. And the four capsules that I had were the K47, a genuine Neumann capsule, K67 again from Neumann. I couldn't get a brass CK12 from AKG. They don't make them anymore, actually. Uh, so those are hard to find and valuable. I had a, a very nice CK12 replica capsule for this test. And then I had a Tiersch M7, which is probably the most common M7 you'd be able to find on the market if you were going to try to buy one yourself. Um, so I installed each of these capsules into this microphone. The grill was the same. The volume of air inside the grill was the same. The height of the capsule above the deck was the same. The distance from the speaker, which was calibrated, was the same. Temperature, humidity, everything was controlled. The only difference from test to test was the capsule. And so what this picture shows us is the difference in sound of these capsules. And you can see at a glance, if you've ever seen a frequency response graph, these all sound really different. Um, and, and furthermore, you can see that if you wanted to get to one of these lines, the other, the other lines aren't going to get you there. They're, they're different enough that it would be really hard to get from one to the other through some kind of EQ mechanism uh, in, in the circuit, for example. So uh, let's call out a couple of characteristics. So the M7 is the orange line. and Oh, and I should mention too, at my test dist distance, we are seeing some proximity effect here. Okay. I didn't try to correct for that. But in most uses, like on a vocal, you'd have some proximity effect anyway. So I felt like that was Absolutely. okay. And furthermore, um, they were all measured at the same distance, right? So the proximity would have been the same for all of them. So what we're, what we're literally seeing here is the difference in sound from the capsules. So the M7 has less bass response, right? It's the flattest output uh, of all four at the left side of the graph, 200 hertz and below. Um, so that means it has you know, one of two things, less proximity and or just less bass output. Um, whereas the CK12 has the most. So if you want to talk about a mic with a quote-unquote warm low end, uh, a, CK a CK12 style capsule is one of the ways you can get there. It has the fullest low frequency response. Um, let's look at some high end characteristics. The, uh, the K67, the green trace, the green line, has the biggest output at 10K. It's up, what is that, one, two, three, four and a half dB if I'm counting right. Um, now, it should be said that in a good microphone, that response, that high frequency response would be tamed by in-circuit EQ. So earlier, Warren mentioned that the Roswell Delphos had a very controlled top end. It does have a K67 capsule in it. How does it have a controlled top end when it's wildly out of control in this graph? Well, because the circuit is correcting for that high frequency boost that's built into the capsule. Nice. That's true. 
That's true of the U67. That's true of the U87. It's true of a lot of microphones that contain that style of capsule. It tends not to be true of cheap microphones that have that capsule. And that is the, the quote unquote Chinese mic syndrome where you've got 10 K for days and all your tracks sound terrible because all you hear is that sort of brittle, harsh top end response. Um, but what I've got here is the native response of the capsule. I did not attempt to correct it because I wanted to demonstrate what the capsule itself sounds like. Um, okay, look at the red trace. Uh, there's a bump around 4K. That is the characteristic K47 response. If you want that kind of mid-range detail, that's a phrase often associated with K47 style mics. If you want that mid-range detail, that's the capsule you have to use. You're not going to get that sound out of any other capsule except maybe the M7, but that's a lot more neutral. See, the orange trace is down 2 dB or so from there. Okay, so again, this if you can read this graph and, and kind of remember these few characteristics, you know, uh, reduced proximity, M7, bigger bottom end, CK12, broader high-frequency boost, CK12, uh, mid-range detail, you know, K47, M7, et cetera. If you can remember those couple of characteristics, then knowing what capsule is in a condenser mic helps you to understand what that microphone is going to sound like before you even use it, before you plug it in. Uh, now, as, as I said a minute ago, the circuit does have some impact on this as well. Um, it's moderate as compared to the capsule. Okay, the capsule is 90 plus percent of the sound of the condenser. Yeah, the grill has an impact. I, 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 I try to be, I try not to be too pedantic about these things, but as a designer, I, all these things matter. So yeah, the grill makes a difference. The height of the capsule inside that that area makes a difference. Um, but in general, the capsule itself is what determines significantly the frequency response of the microphone. Um, but let's talk about circuits. The circuit does have an impact. Um, for our purposes, this simple kind of block diagram level is sufficient. Uh, condenser, mic circuit, uh, condenser mic circuits have an input and an output circuit. And on the input side, typically you're going to see one of two things. It's either going to be a transistor, as to, uh, which is to say a JFET, or a tube. And on the output, you would typically have an electronically balanced circuit, which is like uh, transistors and capacitors and resistors, or a transformer. There are other choices, okay? This does not uh, pretend to represent the entire world of choices, but these are the ones you will most typically see. Um, let's do a quick spotter's guide for these two. Tubes are easy to spot. Usually it's a big glass thing with metal parts inside. Sometimes it's not a glass thing, but it's a metal thing. Those, those three red devices are actually old RCA metal sleeve tubes. Uh, but you can see that when you look inside the microphone. Transformers um, are pictured on the right side. A transformer is a stack of metal, little metal bits with a coil of wire around them. It's a gross simplification, but that's what it looks like. You can see one there. Sometimes those are installed into a can or a pot. So if you see a big metal can with wires coming out, Probably it's a transformer. Another way to find out the topology of a mic or what kind of capsule is in it is to go to the Recording Hacks website. That's, in fact, why that website exists. Because as I was figuring all of this stuff out, I started documenting it. Because it helped me understand what all these things would sound like. So what are the sonic effects of all this? Well, just as we saw with um, ribbons and moving coil dynamics... There are effects of these choices, these topology choices. In other words, what kind of circuit is in there? Uh, a transformerless FET microphone tends to be transparent. It tends to have low distortion, tends to have low noise, tends to have really good transient response. So it really gets out of the way of the capsule. And some people mm -hmm. associate this with a more modern sounding microphone. It doesn't need to be that way because there's a, I mean, that's a, that's a really, a, maybe even a harmful oversimplification, but that's one, one way to think about things. Um, if you put a transformer in the microphone, you have the potential for harmonic content because transformers can kind of create this. So you put in uh, a, a 10 hertz sound and you get out 20 and maybe 30. Sometimes that's beneficial. Sometimes it's not. Typically, you like even order or, or second, uh, second harmonics because they're in key. Typically, you don't like third harmonics because they may not be in key with, with your input signal. But you have the potential for that with the transformer. Uh, you also have the risk of unwanted coloration, like third harmonics. Um, and you have the risk of audible roll-off at the top or the bottom end. So a lot of transformers, if they want to have the, a full low end, 
you'll see a sacrifice up at 20K. You'll be down a couple of dB at 20K. It's not necessarily intentional. Um, it's a characteristic of the way the transformer was made. Um, everything about mic design is, is about trade-offs, okay? Um, the, the goal of the mic designer is to find pleasing trade-offs, okay? To find a transformer, for example, that gives you musically useful coloration as opposed to harmful artifacts. Uh, the same applies to tubes. Tubes give you the potential for harmonic content, but there's also the risk of noise and microphonics. Okay, so um, those are some of the sonic effects of the topology choices that we've made. So now we come to the, the second sort of money page of this entire thing. Uh, again, we're focusing on condenser microphones. And um, what we're trying to get to is a tool that lets everybody fill that gap in their mic lockers. And so what we have here is a grid. Uh, let's ignore that small diaphragm column on the right side. We've got a grid of the four main large diaphragm capsule types and then rows that represent the three different circuit topologies. And what I would propose to everybody is that these characteristics, capsule type and circuit, tr circuit type, largely determine what that microphone is going to sound like in a way that is actually a little bit predictive for you. And so what's written in the boxes is not at all a shopping guide. Uh, it's, it's not a statement that these mics are good or bad. They're just examples that you've maybe and, and hopefully heard of. And uh, some of them are more scarce. For example, there aren't a ton of M7 microphones in the world because that capsule is fiendishly hard to make. So there's fewer things to pick from. Um, and, and, and some of them are grossly overrepresented, some of these choices. The K67 column in that first row, JFET transformer list, see that line at the bottom, it says hundreds of cheap mics. Doesn't make it a good thing, right? Yeah, there's a million microphones that, that have those components. Doesn't mean they're good, it just means they're easy to make and inexpensive. So again, not a shopping guide and not a list of recommendations, but rather just examples of choices. So I what I would encourage people to do is to recreate this grid and then use, either look inside the mic to see what's in there or look at recording hacks or find out how you can classify your microphones. And let's say you're that guy with the five MXLs and uh, you have to write three of them in that same box that says hundreds of cheap mics and two in the, uh, in the SDC column. And well, guess what? You know, as you might expect, if that was your mic collection, you're going to be in for some rough sessions. Well, this grid kind of tells you the same thing. If every mic you own fits into one of these boxes, I think you're going to be in for some rough sessions because you're going to put up a mic and it won't be right for the source, whether it's a voice or a guitar or a piano or whatever. It'll be too thin or too bright or too harsh or too boomy. And you'll take it down, you'll put up your next mic, and guess what? It's going to have the same problem if it's, if it's the same mic under the hood, right? So the point of this is this lets you decide what boxes you need to fill to flesh out your mic collection. Because if you take two microphones that are in the same box, they're going to be in the same kind of sonic neighborhood. If you take two microphones that fit into different boxes, chances are they're going to be pretty different in terms of what they sound like. Remember that frequency graph of the different capsules, right? So if you have two mics that fit into different columns, they're pretty guaranteed to sound different because they have a different capsule, and that significantly changes what the mic is going to sound like. Um, one last thing I want to say about this. Several of my microphones are in there. And uh, as much as I'd love for you to buy Roswell or Mic Parts products, that's not why they're in there. Uh, rather... Think about this in, in, from the other direction. This grid is something that I've been thinking about for five or 10 years. And as I design products, I'm trying to put them into different boxes. Okay, so, the, so this grid is actually kind of my product development guide. And so the Roswell Mini K47 fits into that top right box. The Roswell Delphos fits into the second box in that top row. The Roswell Colaris, which is not out yet, I showed a, uh, the circuit board prototype last time we were here, uh, it's in the third column, second row, okay? It's gonna be this beautiful JFET transformer circuit with a very, very different capsule in it. And it's gonna sound night and day different from the other two. The fourth mic we come out with, guess what? Different box altogether, okay? So, so that's why my stuff's in there. I'm trying to put one in every, every one of these boxes. So that's it for the, uh, for the content here. Um, I'm going to exit the screen share because you can download the key pages from this and then we can get into some questions. Yeah, there's, there's a million. I think you may have, 
you may have been answering them as you go because one of the first ones that came up was the differences between the K47 and the M47, and you did explain them. So my question actually would be, I'd like to know a little bit, because I only know splattering. I'd actually like to know, just as a geek, what is the um, – what is the reasoning between the differences of the 47 and the M7? What I mean is, like, the M7 is the original, is that correct? And then the K47 came after it, and why did they change? It was because of the polyurethane? You know, why didn't you yeah. explain? Because I have a small amount of knowledge, which is very dangerous. Sure. <laughs> I have I have a little more and could be Good. more dangerous. I'm sure you do. Um, I'm not a historian, so I'll tell you what I know with the caveat that uh, I, I think it's directionally correct. I believe the M7 was first. Um I know that it is very difficult to make. Uh, it, it was originally made with PVC. Um, PVC is a material, and, and it was thicker. It was a thicker diaphragm as well, which makes it sound different. But PVC also ages uh, aggressively. Uh, so a 10-year-old PVC diaphragm might be done. Uh, opinions differ, but mylar is much more impervious to uh, aging. Uh, it, it ages better. It ages less audibly, put it that way. Um, At what point but, did they change from the capsules? I don't know, because I'm not a historian. But the other thing I was going to say about this is that the uh, the M7 is extraordinarily difficult to make because um, if you picture a slab of brass um, and you, you lay the diaphragm on top of it, uh, to make an M7, you, you lay your diaphragm down. And on that slab of brass, if you look at like a, at a cross section, there are these little grooves. So here's your backplate surface, and then there are a couple of grooves, two or three grooves. And you need to lay the diaphragm material down and then poke with a needle pinholes inside that groove and then inject crazy glue, more or less, into that trench to, the, to glue the diaphragm down. And if you put in too much glue and it overflows that trench into your backplate area with all the holes drilled, then you get to peel it off and scrub it out and maybe the other side too and start from scratch. So it's very time consuming, very difficult to make. Compare that to a K47. It is still a single backplate and there are problems with that, but you lay that down and there's a video of uh, the Neumann factory making a capsule. I don't know that it was a 47. It may have been a 67, but the process is the same. You lay down the pretensioned mylar and then you lay the clamping ring on top and you put your screws through and you're done. And then you turn it over and do the other side. And there's none of this sort of pinhole poking and glue injecting business that must be incredibly time consuming and wasteful. I mean, imagine the last pinhole on the second side and you put in too much glue and you've do been doing this for 30 minutes and then you've got to destroy it and start over. Crazy. Does that, but that description probably uh, helps me understand why every U47 sounds completely different to every other one. I mean, I have a 47 and a 48, and my 48, I think, was 1950, 1953, and the 47 is slight. I can't remember. I know the 48's older, and I couldn't have two more different-sounding mics in my entire life, although right. essentially circuitry-wise and capsule-wise they're supposed to be the same. Now, obviously, they age differently and all that kind of stuff, but I've used... We actually, at the 48s, we had consecutive serial number U48s at one studio. It was, um, uh, it was the studio in Bloomington, Echo Park Studios. It's Mike Wanchek's studio. And they were consecutive serial number U48s, and they could not be more different sounding. And they'd owned them for 20-plus years. So right. most of their lifespan at that point in the early 2000s was by these two guys that owned the studio. Right. So... I so wonder, because you're describing it, they're treated the same, but the way you're describing it is so, I mean, what do I know, but just sounds so intricate and, and so many possible ways that a human could yeah. change the characteristics. Well, it's even more than that. You know, all those old capsules sounded a little bit different because they were, uh, so, so the, all these capsules have something in common. There's a, um, a, basically a piece of metal with holes drilled in it. Some of the holes go all the way through, and that's done for pattern control so that sound from behind the microphone can get to the front and cause phase cancellation, which is how you create a cardioid pattern. Other holes are drilled. They're called blind holes. So you've got your slab of metal and the hole goes partway through. And that's done to, to create a damping air cushion 
so that when you're making noise in front of the microphone, that diaphragm goes partway in, but it has enough air behind it that it doesn't slam into the back plate, um, which would cause a, a dropout and other, you know, pop noises and different things. So, um, so these days, uh, they're, the capsules are made by a computer, computerized drill press. And um, it's, it's a machine that, that's drilling the hole to a depth that's measured in microns. And it's checking itself for bit wear. So as the drill bit wears down, the controlling arm has to go lower to compensate for wear, right? So the capsules today are incredibly consistent. But in the 1950s, it was a dude with a beard and a mustache and a leather apron and a, and a drill press. And, you know, two holes next to each other. It's you, but different. you need a leather apron. You got to bed. <laughs> 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 but the, the consecutive serial number thing always you know, makes me laugh because it could have been a Friday afternoon and a Monday morning. I mean, yeah, oh, theoretically, yeah, totally. theoretically yeah. they're the same. But the truth is, the way those were made, they just didn't have the controls, the systems to control them to that level of detail. So any two consecutively made capsules could have sounded pretty different. Now, they both sounded great, probably. Uh, they, because they both sounded great. What was interesting is the one that we preferred, and this is going to but all logic was a little darker. Ah. We actually preferred it, um, which may indicate, and this was what was interesting. We used, I used it on an album um, about four or five years ago, and the singer fell in love with it. And when he tried to buy, and it was a guy with a lot of cash, it was a famous singer. So when he tried to buy, and this is interesting, it was Steven Tyler, I'll just say, obviously, and he'd only ever recorded on U67s. And that's his sound. That's the sound of Aerosmith, the U67. So I break out the U48, and he's like, what is this? And I, I, my mind was blown that Jack or nobody had ever used a 47 or a 48 with him. But it makes sense. The 67 is kind of a rock and roll vocal mic. It's pretty amazing, let's be honest. Um, so he fell in love with it, and he loved what it did because it had, he called it the warmth and the low end. But it was probably just because it didn't have a hyped high end. And... Um, so we then went on the journey of trying to find a mic because I wouldn't sell him that mic. Right. And of course, there's no other mic that's going to sound as good slash bad as, as my one. Because the problem is, is that you could probably put it up on another instrument and people would say, this sounds terrible. Uh, but you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. oh, this world we live in of uh, subjectivity. Uh, yeah. And we're judging you know, new microphones against old vintage stuff, which wasn't consistent because there was so much potential, as we're pointing out, for human error. Not that the, it was ever bad, don't get me wrong. I'm sure the human sure. error was, you know, these, these were incredibly well-made made microphones by German technicians in beautiful factories to very high levels. And their tolerances were probably so much better than anybody else's. Um, but one of the questions I want to, to somebody... Dimitri said earlier, and it was touching on what was going through my mind during the whole discussion, is are we purely reliant on old ideas of making microphones? Because it, it reminds me of like jet engines. You know, um, Frank Whittle's jet engine design is exactly what GE and everybody still uses to this day. His design from like 1920, whatever it is, early 30s, is still the exact same jet engine design. Is that true of microphones? Did they get it right and now we're just emulating? Or is there, are we waiting for some revolutionary concept? Because it does seem kind of unusual that in our, in our modern world, we're continually evolving. We're going from gas, you know, petroleum engines to hybrid to electric. I mean, is there... Right. Uh, you're a micro you're a guy that knows more about microphones than I'll ever know. Is that is that on the cards? You know, I, I think I think the answer is yes and no, and it kind of depends on your level of granularity. So, are we ever going to have a microphone that doesn't have a capsule in it? I don't know what that would even look like, right? You need a transducer, and then you need something to take that 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 transduce signal and make it appropriate for plugging into your your preamp. Okay, so the basic topology of capsule and power supply and impedance conversion. I don't know that I see that going away, um, but there is innovation. There's a lot of innovation. People are talking about making diaphragms out of graphene, which is like, if you're a graphene expert, forgive me, but it's like a single molecule layer of graphite or something. And it has 
some amazing properties in terms of its, well, just amazing properties that could be appropriate or could be useful for a microphone. So, but that's still a capsule, right? It's still some kind of transducer, some kind of capacitor-ish thing that captures sound and converts it to voltage. So, uh, look at the uh, AT5040 that I showed a, a, a couple of photos of a little bit ago. So, it's a two by two grid of capsules. That's weird. Like no one's ever put four capsules in the same plane in a microphone before. Josephson has some that has have two or three, but uh, but they're different, and uh, they tend to be you know this one's for this and this one's for that, or they're for pattern control or something like that. So there was a reason for that. This is a two by two grid. Why I don't really know, but uh, one of the one of the side effects is that it. Um, uh, it has really high output, super high output, because you have basically four capsules, and they're electrets, which is also a newer thing. So electrets didn't exist in the 50s. Um, electret, an electret is a type of condenser capsule that doesn't require an external power source. Um, but, uh, oh, the other innovation for the AT5040 is the, uh, it's rectangular. Now, they didn't invent that. Um, Pearl and MyLab have been making rectangular capsules for a long time, and they have some interesting characteristics, at least the I've never tested this, but what they say is that uh, a round capsule has a single resonant frequency, like a drum head does. But a rectangular uh, diaphragm capsule has two resonant frequencies, right? One for the length or width and one for the other dimension. And they're different. And therefore, they're both lower amplitude than the one that would happen on a round diaphragm. So what's the challenge of a round diaphragm? Well, it resonates in the audio band which means there's a peak, a frequency peak somewhere that you can hear because of the design of the thing. Whereas if it's rectangular, maybe you've got one at 200 hertz and one at 8K, but they're both lower amplitude than the round diaphragm. So you can, you have to do less to fix that resonance, right? So, so maybe there's some benefits to that. So yeah, there's a ton of innovation, and, uh, but it's at a smaller level of granularity than, you know, this is a microphone now, and you don't even need to plug it in. It just, you know, what does that mean, right? So, um, so somebody's saying here that they have Aura Sound Graphene Q headphones. Um, so George Massenberg likes them. So it looks like there is some people moving towards that. So we're getting lots of questions about different. I, I, I don't want to. The, the Stam comes up a lot. Warm comes up a lot. A lot of these companies that make inexpensive 67-ish, 47s, also 1073s, you know, there's these companies that are taking name brand recognition and, um, you know, are they all using the same capsules pretty much from the same source? You know what? It's it's, it's interesting because I get this question all all day. You know, um, right? Yeah, everybody wants to buy a U eighty seven. Everybody wants to buy a U forty seven. Yeah, um, those are the two most common questions I get. The U forty seven is a really hard one because you can't make a U forty seven clone. In fact, I'd argue you can't make a U eighty seven clone either. Um, and I guess it depends on how strictly you want to adhere to the formula. Um, in the case of the U87, lots of people make capsules like that. Um, and, and you can certainly make a copy of the U87 uh, circuit. What I, what I would caution people about is that the, the circuit that's most often quote-unquote cloned of the U87 is the old U87i, which Neumann stopped making in like the mid-80s. And it was, uh, it was the one that had the batteries in it and it had lower output, much lower output. And by modern standards, it's, it's a mic that would require um, a pretty high gain preamp. Um, so if you're shopping for a cheap, you know, again, a cheap U87 and you end up with one that's cloned the old model, um, be careful because your preamp might not be up to it. Uh, on a quieter track, you know, an acoustic guitar or a vocal, you might have a lot more preamp hiss in there than you wish you had. Um, and that's because they copied the circuit that ran the capsule at 40 volts and has a lot lower output. Um, the numbers were 10 millivolts for the old one, and I want to say 28 in cardioid for the new one. So there's, uh, there's some delta there. Uh, on the U47 side, integral to the sound of that mic is the, uh, the VF14 tube 
which was a steel tube that hasn't been made in 50 plus years. And you can't buy them. Uh, there is no cash of those. You can't go on eBay and buy one. In fact, if you do, you're going to get one of the ones that Neumann decided was too noisy to use in the 50s. So why would you spend $3,000 on that? It looks right. It's got the right name on it, but you know it wasn't good enough then. Why is it good enough now? I don't think 50 years have made it less noisy. So there are I think it of, might be even longer than 50 years. Yeah, I know, I know what I, you mean. I, I hate to admit how old I am. It's probably more like 65 <laughs> Um, yeah, but uh, so there are U forty seven ish mics that use a different tube. Um, you know, is the EF fourteen close enough to a VF fourteen, uh, even though it runs at a different voltage? Can we just you know not tell anyone that and pretend it's still a a U forty seven? Can we just not put a tube in it at all and not tell anyone? I mean, you know, different manufacturers have uh, they embrace the truth at different levels. So I would say be careful about buying a cheap U47. There isn't a cheap U47. There are mics that look like it. They probably don't sound much like it. Yeah. I mean, I have, I have some, I have your microphones, obviously, um, you know, outside of, um, AKG, you know, and Neumann and all of, all of the, the big guys, I have your microphones. I have some Peluso. I liked, um, we liked his, um, 67. It didn't sound like my 67, but it sounded like a really good mic. And I have a fondness for that, for that company, you know, cause I know it's a small family run business. I, you know, that's probably yeah. just me. And, uh, I wouldn't say it sounded just like my 67, but I would say it was a really good sounding mic and definitely good value for money. Mm -hmm. I think that that's the sort of place I'm at. I think that we're in a different world because, Let's, let's be really brutally honest. If you invented a product now, you say you invented a product and you called it a U96, whatever, you would own U96, you would own the patent, and nobody else would be able to make a clone of a U96. But we live in a world where you can go back to these things that weren't patented and, and, and intellectual property wasn't owned in the way that it's owned now. So it's the ability of a lot of the, the companies to make cheaper products that use the name and the look of a microphone, maybe copy or anything, look of a, you know, it's like Neves, everything's got a blue color. You know, it doesn't matter if it's, if it's a clone, it doesn't matter if it's not using any of the transformers, they just put, you know, it's, and I'm not saying, I'm not trying to be critical, I'm just being honest, that if you, if, you, if, if, it, was, if it was now, and I built a brand new mic pre and called it a, a KKU1946, you couldn't call your mic pre that or use the same color because I would patent it and I would copyright it and that's what everybody right. does now. So we're in this sort of strange world where I think the biggest thing for me is Poltex because I have some real Poltex, for instance. And I'm just going to use this as an illustration. I don't go off for too much of a tangent. But the way that they're built is they can take massive dynamic range. However, any of the cheaper built ones, without getting critical of any companies, cannot take it because they mm -hmm. don't have that quality. And it's tough. It costs a lot of money to put really expensive transformers or really expensive components into something. Now, but you can build something that looks just like it. And you can right. call it something. So it's a real tough one. I don't want to be critical of cheaper stuff because it's a great way to get people in it. But it is difficult because we are... People are buying things based off a photograph of John and Paul singing on a U48 at right. Abbey Road. That's why people right. buy U47s and U48s, because we all want to sound like John and Paul. I do. I'm sure you do, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Well, the hard, thing about, the, the hard thing about microphones is that the shortcut to marketing is to call it 4767. And um, I... I kind of hate that. And I'm saying that in full knowledge that one of my products yes. is called the K47. Yes. I put the K in there intentionally because I'm trying to be a little bit more accurate about what I'm talking about. The mini K47 by no means is trying to pretend it's a U47 or a cheap U47. Hell, it's not even a tube mic. It doesn't look like it. And I don't think it sounds like it. Now, people have put it up on a piano and said that it's a dead ringer for a FET 47 in you know that day on that source. That's awesome. It should. It's got the same capsule in it, and the circuit doesn't have that big an impact. Okay, so there are certain sonic similarities, but I am not going to pretend that it's a U47 or a clone or a tribute or something like that. 
but the name is a reference to the capsule that's in there. But for the, the typical microphone company that's coming out, if the choice is, I'm going to build something and call it a, a U67 or a 67, or I'm just going to call it the ABC123, well, guess which one's going to sell more? Nobody needs an unknown mic manufacturer to invent something new. But everybody wants an 87, a 67, and a 47, and then maybe a 251. Okay, those numbers are magic because those microphones are revered. And so, uh, so it ends up sucking, actually, for, for manufacturers who are trying to do the right thing because I don't want to make a U47 as a Roswell product because you can't. You can't get a VF14 tube. So what am I going to do? I can't make a U87 because Neumann owns a patent on the metalwork. And if I make mine look different, it's not going to sound the same anyway. And yeah, I could lie to you and call it, well, this is the Roswell 67. And, uh, and it's, you know, it's for people who can't afford a real 67. That's not my way. Um, and I, I, I don't think that serves customers very well. Um, we do sometimes talk about sonic references. Uh, a lot, in fact, a lot of people say that the Delphos sounds U67-ish in certain cases, and that's because it's a neutral-ish kind of microphone. Uh, it ends up having a lot higher output and a lot lower noise than any tube mic ever will, um, which in some cases is beneficial, and in some cases, you, you know, you want that tube sound. Okay, there's a, a lot of room for those choices. But um, So, I don't know. We're walking a fine line uh, that I'm trying not to cross, for what it's worth. But there's that... No, no, totally. Um, no, it... No, this is it's a it's it's a good discussion though because um, it's not saying that we're not saying that some of the with the the cheaper name cheaper products that use the name are bad. We're just admitting, obviously, to everybody watching and even the companies themselves that they're using those names as brand recognition. And it's just it's something that you can't do nowadays because of the way people protect their copyrights and their intellectual property, etc. Um, you know, Fender didn't do it for, for goodness sake. The only thing they copyrighted was a headstock. So every, I have a lot of Fender looking guitars. There's a Yamaha here, which is fantastic. But I bought it because I wanted a cheap strap and I didn't want to go out and spend $2,000 on an American strap. So I bought a cheap Yamaha and it's great. But look at it. It's a strap body shape. Um, mm. If I invented a brand new guitar now, I would copyright it the way it looked and you would not be able to steal my shape. Right. But it's great brand recognition to build a, a, a guitar and no disrespect right. for Yamaha. They're, they're trying to push their products and make it look a strap. That's just the way world it's in there. I wish we, I, I think, um, I think we're both saying the same thing. I wish we could just talk about microphones, and it, uh, you know, specifically on the good and bad of the mic as opposed to which clone is best or which this. Because right. ultimately, um, when you're using completely different components to make them very cheap, whether it be microphones or mic pre's or compressors or whatever it is, or consoles, when you're building out of a different component, you're going to get a different result. Yeah. And unfortunately, the older equipment, either A, as you were pointing out, tubes are not available, capsules aren't available or aren't even practical, like in the M7, and then transformers, you know, British or German transformers of the period are just really expensive. So yeah. there's just a lot of expense. So, if something costs three hundred dollars, it can be really, really good, but it doesn't mean it sounds the same as something that costs five thousand dollars. That has a lot. It's just not Absolutely. possible. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so, um, which sort of covered a, covers a lot of the questions here. So that's not taking any away. Just to be really clear to everybody watching, we're not taking anything away from companies like Stam and Warm and Paluso and all of these companies. We're just saying that it's a difficult conversation to compare. Because it's not necessarily like with like. It doesn't yeah. mean that they're good, bad, or ugly. It just means that they're different kind of mics. And it's unfortunate that the name, the nomenclature, is what starts these kind of conversations. Right. But I will say, and I'm, a, I'm an aficionado, I love your mics, but I do like that you put in the um, the LCT 940 into your um, um, your tube large diaphragm condensers because that is a really good sounding tube, large diaphragm condenser that doesn't really emulate anything. It just sounds good. Right. And it was nice that you put it in there without me pushing you to do it. <laughs> Cause I really like that mic. I really do. And I like the innovation of having a FET to a tube and being able to blend it. Right. And, um, there's, so that maybe goes back to what we were talking about 20 minutes ago is that yes, there are companies that are just, you know, uh, just building microphones that aren't necessarily, 
you know, making them clones or, or whatever as well. Um, people are asking uh, a lot about the slate. Oh, what the VMS. Yeah. Um, so I've never used it. Um, I've heard uh, people get good results with it. Um, yes. I, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't have a lot to say. I mean, as a microphone manufacturer, I hate it, right? Because the idea that <laughs> someone could buy that and never buy another microphone um, bothers me. You know, I, I don't know. Well, I know of one other uh, microphone emulator company that would say that uh, that the that there are more detailed ways to embrace emulation. So there are factors that are not necessarily considered in some implementations. And if that's true of the slate, then I would say, well, you know what? Maybe that's true of this other one too, where the actual microphone maybe does respond differently to proximity and factors like that. So there are, I, I do believe there are things that happen in the capsule that where, you know, where, the, where the membrane is responding to the sound waves, where this one's going to be different than that one, and that can't be emulated. That said, no one's ever going to buy, you know, unless you're Greg Wells, you're not going to have all those microphones. So, uh, you know, maybe right. it's a way to go. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I have, I have a lot of those microphones, 47, 48, C12As, not C12s, but C12As, which sound phenomenal, which somebody was asking about Freddie saying, was he singing into a silver uh, AK AKG414? No, he wasn't. He was he sung into a AKG C12A. Um, and I have AEAs and RCAs. The only mic I don't have that would be um, considered something I should have is a C12. And the one thing I'll say about the Slate, in my humble experience, is the C12 emulation is pretty darn good. It's one of those things that I'm going to spend $1,000 to cover a bunch of different uh, ranges. I'd much rather spend $1,000 on a C12 emulation for the one in five singers that, that the C12 works on yeah. than to buy a C12. It's just it's kind of horses for courses. It's almost like I'd look at your cheat sheet and I would look at the feasibility and then be like, well, if I wanted the ultimate C12, and maybe buy the, the VMS, it is really good. So, you know, um, but yes, there's always going to be factors because it's always going to come down to a capsule and yeah. how good a capsule is. And then depending on how good that capsule is, you're then having to um, make up for its shortcomings or, 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 or whatever it might be. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of engineering that goes into um, algorithms that probably goes in for making up with, you know, something good or bad about that particular capsule. Right. So, so take an example of, like you were saying that the U67 is a good rock and roll sounding mic. Um, Definitely. In a sense, the sound of rock and roll is dependent on the sound of a condenser mic being driven, being pushed into some distortion. Sure. Um, now that's, that's a combination of factors of how close it's worked, how loud the singer or the source is. Um, and I, you know, some emulations are going to nail that and, and some may, may not. And I, again, I haven't heard it, so I can't speak to specifics, but I would just say there are, in a general sense, there are behaviors of microphones, whether it's the way you use them, how close you are, is it a room mic from across the room? So placement and orientation and distance and so on like that. I think some of those factors allow a hardware microphone to respond in certain ways that might be magic that may or may not be captured in an emulation. Because I'm sure those emulations were set up to work on a singer doing a certain thing at a certain distance. And, and maybe all those are just the best thing ever. But there, maybe there are some other applications of some of those classic microphones that you just aren't going to get to. It's something to think about. Fantastic. Yeah, there's a lot of, lot of uh, conversation. I think we, get, we always come back to this same kind of question where people ask, well, if I'm spending $500, why do I have to spend $3,000? Or if I'm, you know what I mean? They want to, uh, we always come back to that same kind of thing is like, is it worth spending so much more money? But I think, you know, that's why you make microphones that are between the 300 to a thousand dollars. I mean, you cover those bases specifically for that. I mean, that's kind of the beauty in what you do. Right. Well, I would charge more if I could. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the reality of starting a company no one's ever heard of is that uh, you have to get your foot in the door somehow. Yeah. Um, the the mini K forty seven is you know it's a two ninety nine mic 
that a, a number of people, including our mutual pal, uh, Glenn Fricker says is his, you know, the best mic he's heard under $500, but it's not even a $500 mic. It's a $300 microphone. Yeah. So, I mean, that feels pretty great to me that my inexpensive mic is beating a bunch of stuff he's heard that actually costs almost twice as much. That's awesome for me. Um, it, uh, uh, so, so yeah, I mean, we would, uh, love to make some pricier models. I don't know that Roswell will ever make a $5,000 microphone. I don't think there's enough 5k costing mic buyers out there in the world to justify that. I think you'd kind of have to be one of those top tier, you know, Bach, Neumann. There's a handful of guys up there who can do that. And that's awesome for them. They make some unbelievable products. I'd love to have that kind of budget. Well, I've um, sort of, what's, so. what's weird is to, as a user of these microphones, um, you know, talking about the expensive mics that I own, I would never buy them again. There's my answer. Uh, interesting. I would never buy them again because I feel like having one really, really beautiful large diaphragm condenser is all I need. I end up recording and making records that people have bought or buy or what or stream these days, and I'm using... $300 overhead microphones, 57s in so many situations, which is so cheap. Yeah. Your kick drum is usually recorded by a dynamic. Your snares are done by dynamics. Most yeah. of the time, Tom mics are dynamics. I mean, I end up only really needing condensers for small diaphragm on acoustic guitar, which I prefer, although I sometimes use large diaphragm. One large diaphragm on, on a vocal it's not always right on everybody, but he's a, a good 47 or 48 is 90% right. Um, and then I have a couple of ribbons, but I leave a ribbon permanently up on my very bright, brittle piano to compensate for my bright, brittle piano. My point right. is, is I, I end up with five different microphones of which some are doubled up, like multiple 57s, multiple small diaphragm condensers for overheads. Yep. I think that's why your cheat sheet works because it sort of focuses that mindset. And I get asked a lot, and I'm sure you do as well, about the differences between all these different mid-priced pieces of equipment. And I feel like in, whether it be microphones or mic pre's or whatever, I'm just like, unless you're going to suddenly like double, tri triple the price, it's a very crowded area. I think that's where you're, you're lucky of your mini K47. And I know that you want to charge more and, and wish you could, but it does sort of kill the really other competitors at three hundred dollar price range. Yeah. Um, because I find it's five hundred to a thousand where there's any kind of improvement, and it's closer to the a thousand. And then again, I like the LCT nine forty because it's the only original sounding, frankly, tube microphone out there. Otherwise, it's spent a lot more money. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's a very crowded thing. I I feel like uh, you know I'm watching all the discussion with people talking about their preference for this different clone of this microphone over that clone over this clone and i i would personally say they're probably all pretty darn similar at a certain price point um just being blunt i mean i personally like the peluso i think it's really good but after using the delphos i probably won't use the peluso quite as much you know it's it's a little bit horses for courses you know um I would say the winner in this conversation for me is definitely the K47. I just think when people are talking about the $500, I'd say just spend the $300 and get the K47. Yeah, thank you for that. You know, um, for those of you who like to solder, DIY <laughs> is the best way to go. And, uh, and yeah, I've got a DIY company. I'm not trying to advertise, but um, I hear this from customers all the time. They want to fill all those boxes in that grid. Um, well, that's, that grid is what fed the Mike Parts product line. So you can build most of those combinations for four hundred dollars or less, and um, and you know w one of them the the T twelve is one combination. It's a transformer circuit with a edge terminated capsule, and that's the one that Greg Wells said sounds like a five thousand dollar mic, and it costs three hundred ninety bucks plus two hours of soldering. So again, DIY is not for everybody, but for those who can, there's an unprecedented price advantage for you uh, to fill up some of those gaps in your locker. So. Um, talk a little bit about that. I've got to pee like a proverbial racehorse. That's what I get from <laughs> drinking too much tea, three cups of tea, followed by two cups of coffee. Well, this are there is, any questions? 
you can yeah, tell me or can I? There's tons. There's tons and tough company. Um, the one I think is like, what about the bottle type microphones that they share? I think I'm glad you, I'm glad somebody brought that up. My personal, I think gun to my head, don't own one. My favorite mic that I've got some of the best sounds outside of the obvious ones is a CMV 563. Yeah. That has been the best room microphone I've ever had and probably the best vocal microphone I've ever used. Um, I know they're remaking them now. Could you talk a little bit about the 563? Because that's quite a unique microphone. And it a is, really yeah. good sounding mic. Yeah. Um, that microphone has been on my short list for years. And uh, I actually kind of forgot about it because I don't really buy microphones anymore. Um, but uh, so for people who don't know, it's, uh, it's you know, and actually I'm not an expert on it. Uh, there's this website I could refer you to where there's a bunch of detail, but uh, it's a Gefell product. And um, if I recall correctly, what's remarkable about it is that it has um, interchangeable capsules um, where you uh, screw it off and screw on a new one in a large diaphragm style mic. And um, what's really cool about that is that you can get, in the context of this conversation, um, you can get to where you're filling up some of those other boxes in that grid. Let's see here, 563. Sorry, I'm just cheating um, on my own website. So yeah, there's a bunch of capsules that they made for it. That uh, Now, the originals, it looks like, were mostly for different polar patterns. Um, the, the sort of modern reinterpretation of the 563, and it's something that was also on my short list for a, a many years, is the Blue Bottle Rocket series. And they had a, um, let's see here, they had a, I believe they had a tube version and a solid state version. And then they had a bunch of different capsules. Whoops. Sorry. There we go. Nope, still not there. Sorry, I'm just researching in real time here. Um, they had a number of different capsules that would get you to different sounds. And um, I think the idea that you can screw off the... Uh, oh, they're called stage one. Oh, that's why I couldn't find it. The idea that you could screw off uh, or unplug the capsule and stick on a new one, I thought was really cool. Because as I said before, the circuit, uh, the circuit's impact on the sound of the microphone is relatively small as compared to the capsule. So one way to think about it is that the circuit is either going to be really pristine uh, or it's going to inject some harmonics. Super gross simplification, but, um, but that's a sense of it. So your solid state circuit tends to be more pristine and your tube and or transformer circuit tends to be more colored, meaning creating some harmonic content or distortion. Um, so then you you unplug the darker capsule and plug in a brighter one. Uh, they they had a capsule that they used to call the the big vocal capsule, which is a phrase that I've borrowed since then for other microphones. Um, they had some different patterns as well. Looks like they had a, uh, some cardioids, a lot of cardioids, an Omni looks like a figure eight. Um, there were some third party capsules that used the same mount as well. So anyway, the 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 five sixty three Gefell and the the modern ones that the blue are uh, are both really cool for that reason. Um, Warren, we were just talking about the 563, but also the blue, uh, what they used to call the bottle rocket is now the stage one, stage two, um, are kind of modern recreations of that 563 concept where it's a bottle mic where you can pop off the capsule and put on a different one. Pretty cool idea. So, so is it, um, absolutely now the question is, is it circuitry wise, the same kind of mic or is it just looks wise? Uh, not circuitry necessarily, and blue has two different, you know, one one uh, tube, one FET, uh, but similar in the sense that it, it's a, a bottle style with detachable capsules and that there's a bunch of different capsules you can plug in. That's the similarity that I was getting to. Not to say that the, that the blue mics are a clone of the 563 at all, more a copy of the concept of that kind of interchangeable capsule bottle style mic. Right. Interesting. Uh, we, we've used them, and I think... Um one of the guys that used to work for me and still works with me, Phil Allen, who's an amazing engineer, um, he, um, he used to work, when he left college, USC, he went and worked for Blue for a couple of years and actually built those. And they used to, this is like talking 12 years ago, I don't know which, I know they've changed ownership since then, but um, I think 
they, they used to let you build your own mic or your own mic pre and then take it. Like you could build one mic pre and one microphone. So he built his own one and he built his own mic pre. And uh, we used that a lot. It used to, I wouldn't say beat, but it used to be an alternative to the U48 when we were tracking down there. And there was quite a few vocals that we would do um, that were done on the, the bottle as opposed to the 48. I think on girls, it was quite nice. It seemed to have, and bearing in mind our 48 was dark, but it definitely seemed to have a little bit more of an open top end. I don't know if that's particularly a characteristic of a, of a bottle or whether that was just in comparison to our 48. Is there any particular com um, characteristic you could describe of that, Mike? No, I don't have enough experience with the bottle style. I mean, there is... Um, some science around the idea that the size of the chamber in which the capsule exists, which in a 48, 47 is fairly large and in a, in a bottle style is really small because you basically got your capsule immediately inside of a screen. So the volume of that air cavity and, you know, if there's any reflectivity off the inside of the grill, you know, in a, in a bottle mic, often that front grill is flat and your capsule's right behind it. And so theoretically you could have some sound that's bouncing back and forth and you'd, you'd get some, uh, resonance potentially out of that um so there are some sonic characteristics but to really get at them you'd have to put the exact same capsule into each environment and test them and i haven't done that so i can't speak to the specifics but um they would be different i if there's a a general truth like oh well bottle style mics always sound like this i guess that's probably not true but i don't know for sure because i haven't i haven't experienced it okay somebody's saying they thought that the bottle was a, a blue bottle was a clone of an RFT7151? Oh, that may be. So um, the, there were some German bottle mics that looked like that, and the, and the blue bottle might be that. Yeah, the, the blue mics we'd been talking about was the stage one, stage two, which are bottle style, but they are not the blue bottle. They're a different line and a different product entirely. Oh, I see. Okay, I see. Yeah, the, the stage one, stage two had detachable capsules, and then you, you, had, you could buy any of a set of capsules, and... They had one, it was really interesting actually when I discovered this years ago, um, they had one capsule that was basically supposed to sound like a C12 or a 251. They had one that was supposed to sound like, and this is remarkable, I never heard it, but uh, the claim was remarkable, it was supposed to sound like an RCA ribbon in a condenser mic. Now that's a feat, wow. that would be a pretty dark capsule considering that the circuitry isn't changing. You know, often the way that you make a darker condenser is that you roll off the highs in the circuit, but to manufacture a capsule that was that dark that's there's some some engineering there um they had some omni capsules they had i think some figure eight capsules um but even within just the realm of cardioid condenser capsules which is you know face it what you almost always reach for for a vocal recording they had several different voicings and they had identified a um like a sonic influence again an rca ribbon a c12 they probably had an 87 ish kind of thing right they probably had a 47. Yeah. They did have a 47-ish kind of thing, right? So they were trying to, in a sense, fill all those boxes, right? They were trying to put a check mark in each one of those columns uh, for that microphone by popping off one capsule, popping on another. Um, that's why I loved the idea of that years ago. I thought, well, that's the the way, that's the shortcut way to build a diverse-sounding mic locker. You know, you buy the head amp once, and then you buy all the different capsules. The two strikes against that were that the capsules weren't cheap. They were, I think, like 500 or 600 bucks at the time. At that point, you might as well buy a whole microphone. Um, and, and the second strike is you can only use one at a time. You know? And if all you do is vocal recording, that might make sense. But it, for me, at the, in those days, I was trying to mic uh, more sources at once. And so I didn't want to spend thousands having five ways to record one thing. I wanted to spend thousands, if I had to spend that much at all, being able to record a lot of things at once. So... Yeah, no, I, I like that philosophy a lot, and it's it's one hundred percent what I agree. Like I said, I, I say all the time, and um, so I don't want to sound like a hypocrite. You know, if you look at my studio, I'm sitting. It's over there. There's an SSL four thousand. You know, there's six Poltex in here. There's like freaking nearly every mic you can think of, and it's like, but this this is wow. I don't. Want to, I'm going to sound really old. This is twenty plus years of accumulation of equipment. Right. Um, and when I started building my studio equipment, it was like early 90s. And the philosophy about everything was different. I mean, I have a tape machine over here. I have an A80, which is beautiful, a Mark II, my favorite machine from like late 70s where all my favorite records were made. But my point is, is like I have all this stuff. I have V72s. I have a Kadak console. 
you know, I got it specifically because Queen recorded on those same mic pre, you know, all this kind of <laughs> BS stuff that we do as fans. And I think that that's right. uh, another part of what we do. We buy equipment um, as much with our eyes as we do with our ears because we open up a book. Like somebody was saying earlier, they watched the One Vision video, and I've seen that same video on YouTube. Highly recommend it. It's watching the Queen record, and you see Freddie singing on a C12A. So why the heck wouldn't I want a C12A? My favorite scene, you know what I mean? Right, and then, yeah. So there's a lot of passion that goes into it. But what happens for me now with the with – the, um, and the same for you, obviously, which is why the cheat sheet's really good, is you start to get a bit of a focus, and you start going, oh, okay – I now know that there's literally 47, uh, or uh, the pun intended, different ways to record a snare drum. <laughs> there's 47 different ways to do a vocal. There's four, whatever. There's all these different ways, but there's like one style of mic and that we can focus in on like something that's going to do it 90% of the time because there's no one microphone that's always going to be right, but there's so many mics that are really, really super close. And Getting a balanced mic locker, I think, is is really the way to go. Unless you're JJ Blair, you know JJ. <laughs> we talked about him last time. Yeah, he's got a, the mic collection to die for. Yeah, he has the best mic collection. I think of. I I have worked and work at Sunset Sound United. I've been to East West. I've been to NRG. I've been all the big studios in town, and none of them have as big. Sunset has the closest um, and capital. Um, they're all, all those big studios have amazing mic collections, but JJ's is <laughs> insane. The fact yeah. that he has like, oh, you want one of those mics? Well, I've got 22. I mean, between him and Blackbird, they probably have the <laughs> biggest mic collection. Hey, everybody, <laughs> the, everybody watching, we have 260 people watching. That is amazing. Could you all like and share the video? Um, the way that YouTube lets everybody know that we're online talking is by the liking and the sharing. I'm sorry to sound like a bad marketing guy, but yes, if you could hit the like button and share it, that would be absolutely amazing, and then people will know we're here. We have some Academy members online, Ralph, um, and we do have to wrap up in a few minutes because I know that Matt's got a busy day. I've got an insanely busy day. He's been on for an hour and a half, um, so let's have a quick look. Uh, Ralph says, yes, true, it took it took not only money, but time and patience and passion over the years to build a mic collection. Yes, it does. The, yeah. the Loutons, yes, I do like the Loutons. We've got to try Earthworks. I like those two. Um, U47 Fets. Somebody's saying even Fets. Uh, Martin, who is a big follower of ours and I respect greatly, says he's used two U47 Fets, which doesn't even use tubes with consecutive right. serial numbers, and even those sounded different. So oh, it's not always about the tube and the transformer. I think we all want to believe is lots of other things that can can be obviously involved. Well, anything 50 plus years old, you, you can't predict how it's going to age, and there's a lot of capacitors in there uh, that might have leaked or aged in some way, but also a lot of those older German mics um, have been maintained, uh, and some of that maintenance was more true sometimes than others, right? So... I've seen the insides of those microphones with brand new parts in them, and um, they might sound great, but they don't sound like they used to. It's just a yep. reality. There's some people talking about their... Uh, um, oh, this is a good one. Cron saying, what do you think of the PV PVM520? It's been described as a sleeper microphone, a poor man's RE20 SM7. Have you try that? Oh, the, oh, P, uh, the word... PV, yeah, PV PVM520. I've never heard of it. Um, I uh, wow, that's cool looking. Um, I don't know anything about it. Um, I would say try it out. Um, you know, the remarkable thing to me was when I put up a bunch of different mics like this and I spoke into them on a voice I know well, which is to say mine. Um, <laughs> I was amazed at how how different they all sound. Uh, and it's you know a, a couple of dB here and there. I mean that, and that's I know we're splitting hairs, but that's what we do as audio engineers. Um, a couple of decibels higher or lower at specific points in the frequency range can make or break a mic. And this is entirely subjective, of course, but that's what we do. It's what we're paid to do. Um, you, you have to try it, you know, especially about a dynamic mic that you want to use on your voice. There's only one person in the world who can say if that mic sounds good, and that's you. And that's because it's your voice and your ears, and it's what you want to sound like. So you just have to try it. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think that that's a... Um I always say this, I repeat this every day in, in a different phrase, but 
what you just said is 100% true. And I think that that's where I believe in science. I believe in empirical way of looking at things. Of course I do. But when you're talking creativity, the way something sounds to you affects how you perform. And I can't yeah. think, oh I God. cannot, it's like, and I talk about it all the time. It's like if something sounds very bright or very dull or whatever, then I'm going to sing differently. My singer is going to scream more if they want more edge out of it. It's just the way it is. So there's no such thing as the perfect mic because you might have somebody that is screaming and you're trying to control that. So you are going to be looking for something that isn't as detailed maybe in the 3 to 5K range. SM7. <laughs> SM7, Exactly. <laughs> and something that can take the massive dynamic range again sm7 yeah. um you know and there's a and then i want to touch on one other thing before we go there's a lot of talk about and i'm not going to say what the mic is because it's not fair but there was a about three years ago there was a massive uh, um a mic that had like a massive initial launch and sold in bucket loads and we all know everybody that's on it what that was yeah and so i got that microphone and it, um, its main selling point was that you could pretty much chip a radiator with it or, uh, you know, hit it against a brick wall and it would still work. And so I was excited to try it because because all of the – there was, like, actual videos by sort of reputable YouTube guys saying that it sounded like a U87. And it was, what, 300 bucks. So I put it on an acoustic guitar and a vocal, and all it seemed to be was a lot louder and a lot brighter. Mm. And that was really – than some of the cheap other mics in its price range. And then I put it up against a mic that was only $200 more, which was my favorite at that time. It changes, um, especially the Mini K47. My favorite at that time was a, an LCT 550, which I still recommend if you're after a 414 sound and you don't want to spend $1,200 plus, then go for the, the LCT 550. It basically sounds like a 414, but half the price. So I put that up against this mic, which will remain nameless, and it wasn't even close. And I think that I like these discussions is what I'm trying to say. And I like the objectivity you bring to it. Cause even though you make microphones, you're not always just pushing your products. You are giving us the ability to, um, you know, giving us the ability to make these judgments for ourselves. So I just want to sort of like reiterate that. I think it's really, really important. And, and the cheat sheet's great. And it does, so please, if you haven't, everybody, download the cheat sheet. It's underneath the video. Yes, there's some of the Roswell products in there, but you'll also see Matt's philosophy is he's directing you towards a style of microphone, which you can then make your own personal opinion. But I like it because it reinforces something I thoroughly believe in, and I was reiterating earlier, is that really doing it again, five different types of microphones is all I need, five different types. It, that's the maximum for any studio and it really comes down to that because if i go to one of those big studios there's a lot of the same kind of not exactly large diaphragm mics that become flavors like do i want a 67 or do i want an 87 do i want a slight bit of grit and distortion in it or do i want it to be a little you know it's like subtle differences so right. some people go oh i have to have u87s as overheads because i want it to be really perfect and detailed and not colored at all and then somebody else goes oh but i want more coloration from the 67 i mean it's like wow then it becomes all about style like what's your style what do you want you know right. when i made records with dave sardi he would use 67s and 47s on everything and I've heard that Nigel Godrich uses a 67 on everything. That he hmm. pretty much goes acoustic guitar 67, vocal 67, electric guitar 67. And I've worked, you know, with Sardi, we had 47s and 67s on everything. Every single instrument was recorded with those two microphones. Doesn't matter if it was a tambourine, a vocal, acoustic <laughs> guitar, heavy metal guitar, it was just those one or two microphones. So, right. anyway, I'm waffling on. Um, Somebody said, please list my mic locker. Well, I've sort of been doing that, but uh, I'll have to write it all down. So please, everybody, like and share so that everybody knows we're here. Any finishing words, uh, Mr. McGlynn, after I've been waffling on? <laughs> no, just to say thanks again. Uh, I hope everyone got, um, got some good, useful tools out of this. Uh, if you have follow-up questions, I will try to look at YouTube comments for the next day or two. Probably not much beyond that. Uh, but I'm easy to reach through Recording Hacks or Roswell Pro Audio. Feel free to reach out if you have questions. I'm happy to try to help. 
And uh, thank you, Warren, for having me on. Thanks for everyone to everyone for listening. That's it. Marvelous. Thank you ever so much. Hey, Glenn, somebody's saying the cheat sheet's not down here. We keep, we keep uh, testing it here. I tested it. Eric's tested it. And Matt D has tested it. And it's downloading for all of us. So if, Glenn, you have a problem with your uh, um, whatever it is that you can't download it, just email support at produce like a pro and he will send it to you directly. Glenn, just email Matt there. Uh, Matty D. That's not Matt McGlynn. And please, everybody, like and share so everybody knows that, we, that Matt has done this wonderful video with us. Um, yeah, everybody's saying it works. I know, I know it does, but individual stuff. Um, have a marvelous time, everybody. Thank you ever so much, Mr. McGlynn. I really appreciate it. Thank and you. please come back again soon. <laughs> and everybody, uh, I love having you on here because I love having this kind of discussion, even though I know it's... It's really contentious. Everybody gets very opinionated about their clones. We've had a lot of uh, interesting discussion between everybody, and, and I think that uh, that's what makes this such a fun and colourful subject. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Have a marvellous time recording and mixing.